ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون يا ايها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحده وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والارham ان الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما اما بعد فان اصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدى هدى محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار الحمد لله وفيز الله we seek his assistance we seek his forgiveness and we seek refuge in Allah from the evil within ourselves and from our bad deeds whoever Allah guides there is none that can lead him astray and whoever is led astray then there is no guide for him I bear witness that no god has the right to be worshiped other than Allah he is alone and has no partners and I bear witness that Muhammad is his slave and his messenger O you who believe fear Allah as he ought to be feared and don't die except as Muslims O humanity fear your Lord who has created you from a single soul and created from it its mate and scattered from them to many men and women and fear Allah to whom you demand your mutual rights and don't cut off relations with the wombs that bore you indeed Allah is a raqib over you O you who believe fear Allah and say that which is correct in order that he may accept from you your deeds and forgive you of your sins and whoever obeys Allah and his messenger has achieved the greatest achievement amma ba'du certainly the most truthful speech is the book of Allah and the finest guidance is the guidance of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the most evil of affairs are newly invented matters in this deen and every newly invented matter in this deen is a bid'ah and every bid'ah is a strain and every strain is in the hellfire continuing with uh, our class on fiqh in the book al-adillah ar-radiyya li matn ad-durar al-bahiyya fi al-masail al-fiqhiyya by imam al-shawkani with the tahqiq of muhammad subhi hasan halaq we come to the chapter uh, الباب الثاني النجاسات والفصل الاول احكام النجاسات وقال الامام الشوكاني رحمه الله والنجاسات هي غائط الانسان مطلقا وبوله الا ذكر الرضيع ولعاب كلب وروث ودم حيض ولحم خنزير وفيما عدا ذلك خلاف والاصل الطهاره فلا ينقل عنها الا ناقل صحيح لم يعارضه ما يساويه او يقدم عليه chapter the chapter number 2 the chapter of najasat and najasat is the plural of najasa and najasa is anything that is filthy that the people protect themselves from that filth and that when it gets on the clothing then you have to wash it like urine getting on the clothing and this is a general definition for najasa this first section of chapter number 2 on najasa are we verdicts pertaining to najasa and imam al-shawkani rahimahullah he says najasat it is uh the defecation of the human beings in general their urine except for the urine of a young baby boy the saliva of a dog what do you call it uh, i think they call it dung <laughs> i don't know what they okay for animals yeah I don't know what you call it animal stuff. <laughs> uh, the menstrual the menstrual blood and the meat of the pig and everything other than that then there's a difference of an opinion concerning it. As for the origin of everything it is tahara. 
and nothing takes it from his state of being pure except that there is an authentic narration that nothing opposes it or there's something equal to it or something to be placed above it. Here Imam al-Shawkani rahimahullah he starts it off by saying najasat when najasa as we said anything that is considered to be filthy and that uh, people protect themselves from that filth and that if it gets on your clothing then you have to wash it off like urine then this is najasa najasa is the defecation of the human beings in general this uh, in general means whether it's a younger person or an older person that all of this is considered najasa and the proof for this is the hadith collected by Imam Ahmed uh, Rahimahullah and Abu Dawood and it's authentic where uh, Abu Sa'id radiallahu anhu he said anna nabiya sallallahu alayhi wa sallam aqal idha jaa ahadukum al masjida fal yaqlib na alayhi fal yuqallib na alayhi wal yanzur fihima fa in ra'a khabathan fal yamsahu bil ardi thumma li yusalli fihima and this hadith is authentic where the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam He says If one of you comes to the masjid Then let him turn his shoes To the bottom so he can see the bottom And then look at them And if he sees anything filthy Referring to defecation Then let him wipe it off on the ground And then let him make salat In those two shoes So here the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam As he's showing that it's not permissible to make salat in shoes that you have this defecation on the bottom. The ulama are using this hadith of the Prophet ﷺ to show it's that way because it is najis. And that which is najis has to be removed in order to establish the salat. <coughs> also we see in the other hadith of Abu Dawood where the Messenger of Allah ﷺ, he said, إِذَا وَطِئَ أَحَدُكُمْ بِنَعْلِهِ الْأَذَى فَإِنَّ التُرَابَ لَهُ طَهُورٌ the Prophet ﷺ said that if any one of you walks with his shoes on some defecation, then indeed uh, pure dirt or the earth is the purification for that. So yeah, the Messenger of Allah ﷺ showing that it's the purification for it because it is najis. So from these hadith and the other hadith that show that the defecation is uh, najis as Imam al-Shawkani rahimahullah he said and that refers to a person whether they're young or they're old then Imam al-Shawkani rahimahullah he said the urine is najis of the human beings and then he uses for this the hadith collected by Imam al-Bukhari and others where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uh, he says, rather Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu qala, qama arabiyun fabala fil masjid, fatanawalahu nas, fakala lahum nabiyu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam da'uhu, wahariku ala baulihi sajlan min ma'in, aw dhanuban min ma'in, fa inna ma bu'ithtum muyassirin, wa lam tuba'athu mufassirin, aw muassirin. And this hadith of Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu he said that a desert Arab urinated in the masjid. And then the people grabbed him. And then the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Leave him alone. And then pour where he urinated a bucket or a container of water on that area. Because indeed you have been sent to make things easy and you haven't been sent to make things hard. So here the Messenger of Allah salatu wassalam, uh, from this hadith we see that this urine is najis and it has to be cleaned. Uh, as we see from this hadith of the Messenger of Allah salatu wassalam, and we don't want to miss the opportunity to take advantage of this hadith of the Messenger of Allah salatu wassalam, as there's another important verdict in it for us and that is we have been sent those people who are calling to the deen of al-Islam they have been sent to make it easy on the people and not to make it difficult on the people. And it's very important for the people who are learning this deen of al-Islam and when they're trying to teach it to the people that they always take into consideration as the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa says in this authentic hadith that 
you have been sent to make it easy and you have not been sent to make it hard. So we've been sent to make it easy for the people. We have to make sure as best we can we make this deen easy for the people to practice and that we are considerate when the people are mistaken. And the best uh, way to encourage us of making it easy for the people is that yesterday nobody was in a bigger mistake than we were when we were in kufr. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent those people who came to us and called us to Islam. And they were gentle with us in general. And they were easy going with us. And they were considerate until they brought us to this deen. And Allah, sometimes if we think back to the people calling us to Islam. In general, most of the people came to Islam because somebody was taking his time out with him. Explaining to him Islam. Trying to show him what he was on was false. Trying to show him the clear path, the straight path. And we remember those brothers who first spoke to us about Islam. And this attitude is to be always. Not just when you bring in somebody in Islam, but even when you're speaking to the Muslims, we're supposed to be easy with one another and not to be difficult. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for a success. Because of the urine taking the, the verdict that it takes to be in um, it can't be used for anything. Like some people say uh, urine can be used for medicinal purposes when they drink it. Mm. Because of the verdict, it takes, can we do anything else with it except waste and dispose of it? That question, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, knows best. Even though I have an idea, but I think I'm going to hold off right now. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. <clears throat> but I think uh, from the beginning, uh, it will be sufficient for us to say, as we had looked at the definition of what is najasa, that which is filthy that the people protect themselves from. Mm-hmm. And in general, if something is filthy and the people protect themselves from it, it means that the people don't use it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. The Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu salam said, Akfaru adab al qabri fil bawli. That people will be punished in the grave more so for urine than anything else. And this might be another statement from the Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu salam to kind of hint at the direction that I may have said. And that is, if people are going to get punished because of a couple of drops of urine that may splash back on them, when they relieve themselves, then what about the person who drinks it? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows this. The next point that Imam al shokani he says, this is for the urine of human beings in general, except for the uh, young baby boy who is breastfeeding. And this is from the hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, collected by Abu Dawood and others, and it's authentic, where he says, alayhi salatu salam, بول الغل بول الغلام الرضيع ينبح وبول الجارية يغسل. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam in this hadith he said the urine of a young boy who is breastfeeding uh, is to be washed. Uh, excuse me, is to be sprinkled with water, and the urine of a young uh, baby girl is to be washed. Here the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam he shows that uh, the urine or the ulama are extracting from the statement of the Messenger of Allah والسلام, where he's trying to show that the urine of a baby boy isn't najis and just a couple of sprinkles of water on it is sufficient just to uh, clean your clothing off as opposed to the urine of the women of the girls the baby girls it's najis and the thing has to be washed clean in order to get that urine off of it and the Messenger of Allah uh, he, he mentions the same thing in another hadith of Jabir ibn Samura, Samura radiallahu anhu, who said, Anna the Rajul and Sa'al and Nabiya sallallahu alayhi wa sallam at Tawabba'u. No, excuse me. Uh, this is the hadith of Um Qaysin bintu Muhsin, Anna ha atat bibn in laha sagirun. صغير لم يأكل الطعام إلى رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم فبال على ثوبه فدعا بماء فنضحه ولم يغسله. That this hadith of Um uh, Um Qais bint Muhsin رضي الله عنها that she came 
with a son of hers that was so young that he didn't eat any food, meaning that he's breastfeeding at the age where he's breastfeeding and he's not eating any food. She brought him to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and he urinated on the claw on the thole of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So the Prophet والسلام, called for someone to bring some water and then he sprinkled it and he didn't wash it. So this hadith shows that the Messenger of Allah والسلام, used to consider the urine of the male baby who was breastfeeding and not eating any food to be considered uh, uh, from the tahara or from the pure things and not from amongst the najis things and that is sufficient to just sprinkle water on it as opposed to the girl's urine, the baby's girl, uh, her urine, as you have to wash that. Then Imam Ashaw, now. Yes, that's the same hadith. Or the first hadith that we have mentioned. The urine of the boy was breastfeeding, you just sprinkle water on it, and the urine of the little girl, you wash it. That's the hadith of the Messenger of Allah, والسلام, collected by Abu Dawood, and you have the other narration of, uh, of uh, Al Nasai and Abu Dawood and Mumaja and others where the Prophet says, Yugsalu min bowl al jariya wa yurashu min bowl al ghulam. That you must wash uh, whatever uh, is affected by the urine of the baby girl, and you only sprinkle water on the urine from the baby boy. So from these authentic hadith of the Messenger of Allah, والسلام, you see that uh, he makes an exception والسلام, to the urine of the baby boy who is not eating any food, who is just breastfeeding from his mother. Then Imam al-Shawkani, rahimahullah, he shows that the salava of the dog is najis. And he brings the hadith of Imam Muslim where the Prophet sallallahu says, إِذَا وَلَغَ الْقَلْبُ فِي إِنَاءٍ فِي إِنَاءِ أَحَدِكُمْ فَلْيُرِقْهُ ثُمَّ الْيَغْسِلْهُ سَبْعَ مِرَارٍ وَفِي رِوَايَةٍ وَعَفِّرُوهُ الثَّامِنَ بِالتُرَابِ the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, If a dog licks in the container of any one of you, then pour out everything in that container. And then wash it seven times, and wash it the third, the eighth time with dirt. So here the Messenger of Allah alayhi wa sallam, commands us to uh, wash thoroughly uh, seven times with water and the eighth time with dirt. If a uh, dog licks, on any container that we have. And the ulama, they use this hadith of the Messenger of Allah والسلام, to show that the saliva of a dog is najis. They used to show that the saliva of a dog is najis and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. The next point is that uh, he mentions row. Let me just my dictionary. Amr Shokan Rahimullah he brings his nudges, uh, is rawth, and we said is dung. Another word that they use is droppings from the animals. And uh, I wanted to double check that word. <coughs> and this is from the hadith of Imam al Bukhari Rahimullah and others. An ibn Abbasin Radiallah excuse me, An ibn Mas'ud Radiallahu anhu Qala atan Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam al Ghaita fa amarani أن آتيه بثلاث أحجار فوجدت حجرين والتمست الثالث فلم أجده فأخذت روثة فأتيته بها فأخذ الحجرين وألقى الروثة وقال هذا ركس The Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم uh, in this hadith of Imam al-Bukhari uh, he explains that this roth is najis as Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, ma, anhu says that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went to defecate and then he commanded me to bring him three stones. So I only found two stones and I looked for the third stone and I didn't find it. So I brought him some roth or uh, droppings or dung. 
uh, to him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he took the two stones and he threw away the roth and he said, this is riksun or this is filthy, referring to this as being najis. So here the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, uh, in this hadith he shows that roth or these droppings is najis, alayhi salatu wa salam. Uh, I think everybody is looking kind of funny and uh, I remember when we sat with the ulama and we were covering this hadith was trying to explain how in the world do you use that to wipe yourself and uh, they were trying I guess the, the ulama were trying to show us when it dries up it's like this or that and maybe only the people in the, the countrymen or something understand how you can use that Allah subhanahu what the island knows best, maybe somebody here has anything. That's for human beings. And then now, this is referring to the animals. Oh. I don't know if there's any uh, medical knowledge behind the urine of the baby boy and the urine of the baby girl that are breastfeeding before they eat anything, except that we have the most wise of <laughs> men who walked on this earth, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who explained this verdict, وَمَا يَنْطِقُ عَنِ الْهَوَىٰ إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْنِ يُوحَىٰ and he doesn't speak on his own desires. He speaks from revelation revealed to him. So maybe medicine, I don't know if they looked at it now. Maybe they'll find some benefits from it. And I was just, uh, you can take an example with this book, Back to Eden, that deals with all the herbs. It doesn't even deal with honey. and doesn't have a chapter on honey, and it doesn't emphasize it. I don't know if they add it in the newer edition or whatever, but he didn't really deal with it. And then nowadays you see in the health food stores and stuff, people getting involved in the honey because they know of the truthfulness of the statement of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu rather of Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala and the Qur'an. And this is the same thing with the, the black seed. Now you see everybody trying to get on it because they know the truthfulness of the statement of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi wa Alaihi wa Sallam. At any rate, whether we understand or not, we know that the Prophet ﷺ only spoke the truth. ﷺ. The next uh, point that uh, Imam al-Shawkani, rahimahullah, he brings uh, from the things that are najis is the menstrual cycle blood. And he brings the hadith of al-Bukhari, Muslim, عن أسماء بنت أبي بكر بنت أبي بكر بنت أبي بكر أنها قالت سأل سألت سألت امرأة رسول الله صلى الله رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم فقالت أرأيت إح أرأيت إحدى نا إذا أصاب ثوبها الدم من الحيض كيف تصنع فقال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم إذا أصاب ثوب إحدى كن الدم من الحيضة فلتقرص فلتقرصه ثم لتنضح بماء ثم لتصلي فيه The Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم in this hadith uh, shows us as the ulama explained that the menstrual cycle blood is najis as Asma, the daughter of Abu Bakr رضي الله عنهما she said that a lady asked the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم as she said يرس, uh, as she said do you see talking to the Prophet وسلم, if one of us women have some of the menstrual cycle blood get on her clothing, then what should she do? And the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, if any one of you women have some of your menstrual cycle blood get on your clothing, then take the uh, cloth, uh, excuse me, then scrape the, the, when the blood, when it dries up, then scrape it off of the clothing and then wash it with water and then make salat in that clothing. So here the Messenger of Allah والسلام, when he explains to the women they have to scrape off uh, the remaining of the blood that's on the clothing when it dries up and then to wash it 
and then that would make it uh, pure enough for the lady to make salat in it. And the ulama, they use this hadith to show that this blood is najis and that the lady can't make salat in it until she removes it from her clothing as explained by the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa The next point that Imam al-Shawkani rahimahullah he says is najis is the uh, meat of the pig. And this is from the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, from Surah An'am verse uh, 145 Allah tells us <coughs> قُلْ لَا أَجِدُ فِي مَا أُوحِيَ إِلَيَّ مُحَرَّمًا عَلَى طَاعِمٍ يَطْعَمُهُ إِلَّا أَنْ يَكُونَ مَيْتًا أَوْ دَمًا مَسْفُوحًا أَوْ لَحْمَ خِنْزِيرٍ فَإِنَّهُ رِجْسٌ أَوْ فِسْقًا أُهِلَّ لِغَيْرِ اللَّهِ بِهِ Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala says, say, I do not find anything from the food to be haram from that which is revealed to us except if it's dead or if it's gushing blood or if it's the meat of the pig because indeed it is rijisun or fisqun or fisqan uh, slaughtered in other than the name of Allah or uh, slaughtered by other than that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made uh, permissible here in this ayah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had mentioned three things the dead, the gushing blood and the pig and said indeed it is rijis the ulama of tafsir and the ulama of Islam, they explain that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, indeed it is filthy, then it is referring only to the pig. As Allah has mentioned three things and didn't say, indeed they are filthy, but Allah said, indeed it is filthy, referring to the meat of the pig. And this is how the ulama of Islam understand this ayah. And for this reason they say that the meat of the pig is najis. Then Imam al-Shawkani, rahimahullah, uh, uh, he says that everything other than that, from the things that are considered to be najis, then there are a difference of an opinion in it. And the Shaykh uh, Muhammad Subhi Hassan Halaq, he explains uh, what ish, Imam al-Shawkani is hinting at, meaning those other things are a difference of an opinion, like sperm, there's a difference, is it najis or not? Uh, the dead, as it was mentioned in that ayat, and blood gushing forth, uh, alcohol, khamr, uh, al madhyu and this is the fluid that comes out when a man is aroused a little bit, not the sperm, but before that there's a little light color fluid that's real thin. That, and wadi, and this is the fluid after you urinate, sometimes there may be a little something left over afterwards. This uh, this fluid and a mushrik is a mushrik. <laughs> is a mushrik najis or not? Uh, before we take a look at some of these uh, issues that the ulama they differ in. Uh, I wanted to back up and to mention this hadith of Jabir ibn Samara anna rajulan sa'ala nabiya sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ana tawadda'u min luhum al-ghanami qala la qala fa usalli fi marahi al-ghanam qala na'am from this hadith of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uh, in Sahih Muslim where Jabir asked the Prophet sallallahu said that a man asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam can we make wudu after we eat the sheep's meat or eat lamb. And then the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, No, you don't have to make a wudu. Do we have to make a wudu from eating lamb? And the Prophet Sallallahu said, No. Then he said, Can we make salat in the lamb's pen? And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Yes. Uh, some of the ulama, they uh, use this to show that uh, there seems to be an exception with uh, the sheep's uh, urine and what have you as the Prophet ﷺ made it permissible to make salat in that pen and if it was dangerous then it wouldn't be permissible for you to make salat in that pen and this seems to be an exception from that which we had uh, covered already from the urine and the defecation being najis 
also so another exception is uh, from the hadith where the Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu salam, this is the hadith of Al-Bukhari Muslim where he commanded the people to drink the uh, camel's urine as a means of the cure as a means of uh, curing them from their sickness and some of the ulama they say that this is an exception from the general rule of the urine being uh, uh, najis Otherwise, the Messenger of Allah والسلام, would not have commanded them to drink it. So I just wanted to mention these exceptions from this hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Really, to most of us, it sounds a little funny to be drinking the urine of a camel. But I remember being uh, with one of the camels and uh, uh, the owner was milking the camel to give us some camel milk. Uh, you know, you're coming from the city. You don't know anything about animals. All you see is <laughs> a long thing <laughs> and some fluid coming out. And the milk isn't white like the milk that we buy in the store. Real milk, when it comes out straight before this, uh, what do they call it, pasteurization and stuff, that it's not like that. So you're looking at it, and then he gives you the bowl, and the bowl is hot. <laughs> So really, even the milk just seems funny if you, you know, you're not used to it. Somebody give you some hot, dirty stuff. You just saw it coming from that long thing <laughs> of the camel. But uh, the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, speaks the truth. And eventually they'll come. And uh, people have even, in their ignorance, uh, as was mentioned earlier, uh, I think it was Gandhi or something. And... Uh, the one who Martin Luther Kaffer used to follow. Uh, he used to, they said, I forgot how many cups of his own urine he used to drink every day. And this is why he said, uh, turn the other cheek or this non-violent stuff, that alhamdulillah there's no place of it in Islam except amongst the Muslims, alhamdulillah. Uh, it could be, but I said I'm going to stay away from it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. <laughs> okay, amongst the issues of a difference of an opinion, then uh, our Sheikh Muhammad Subhi Hassan Halla, he uh, tries to give the weightiest position in these issues that the people differ concerning uh, uh, them being nudges or not. As far as sperm being nudges, he says, what is most weightiest is that it is pure. That the sperm from a man is pure and he uses this hadith of Ibn Khuzayma in his Sahih Ibn Khuzayma on Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha anha kanat tahuttu al-maniyya min thawbi rasulillah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa huwa yusalli and this hadith is authentic. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha she used to scrape off the dried up sperm from the thobe of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam while he was in Salat. The Messenger of Allah Alayhi Salatu Salam is in Salat making uh, his Salat to Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala and his wife sees some leftover dried up on him from the sperm and she's just scraping it off while he's making Salat. And uh, he's using this hadith to show that if it was najis then the Messenger of Allah Alayhi Salatu Salam wouldn't have made Salat in it. If the question comes, well, maybe the Prophet didn't know what was going on. The Prophet didn't know what was going on when he began to make salat in his shoes. And Jibreel came to him and told him to take off his shoes. And he took off his shoes while he was making salat, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then the people behind him, behind him, والسلام, they took off their shoes. And then the Prophet afterwards explained why you take off your shoes. They said, we saw you take off your shoes. And the Prophet ﷺ explained that Jibreel said that there was something najis on his shoes and this is why he took them off. We have to understand that the Prophet ﷺ, he was sent by Allah wa ta'ala to the, all of the worlds to explain the last, final, and complete deed to humanity. And that nothing is going to be unturned as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَمَا كَانَ رَبُّكَ نَسِيَّةً And your Lord is not forgetful. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't forget anything. He sent this deen and he made this deen perfect and complete. And if the Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu overlooks something, then it's a part of this deen overlooking that. 
Otherwise, the Messenger of Allah والسلام, explained this deen just the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had commanded him to uh, explain this deen as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself tells us in Surah Al-Ma'idah uh, first, uh, first. <laughs> Got that verse. Yeah, here's the verse. Verse number 67 for Surah Tumayyad, where Allah says, Ya ayyuhar rasul, balig ma unzila ilayka min rabbika, wa illam tafal, fa ma balag tarisalata, Allahu ya asimu kamin al nas. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, O Messenger. Proclaim that which was revealed to you by your Lord And if you don't Then you didn't bring the message And Allah will protect you from the people Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is showing That the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Did exactly what he was commanded That he brought to the people That which was revealed to him by his Lord And if he didn't do that Then he wouldn't have brought the message And he brought the message sallallahu alayhi wa sallam As we know in his farewell hajj Where he asked the sahaba did I not bring the message? And they said yes. And he rose, his, he raised his finger up to the sky, uh, showing that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is above the seven heavens. And then he said, "Allahumma sh, Allahumma shahid. Oh Allah, bear witness. Oh Allah, bear witness that I brought this message." So the Messenger of Allah, alayhi salatu wasalam, he brought the message to the people, and uh, he made it clear, alayhi salatu wasalam. So this hadith, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best, as this is amongst the issues of difference of an opinion, shows that uh, sperm uh, is pure and it's not najis. Uh I just wanted to mention this, uh, as I remember, uh, covering this issue, so that we can get a, a little more understanding on some of these difference of an opinion. I remember when I was going over it, uh, in one of the books, Al Bada' al Fawa'id by Ibn Qayyim al Jawziyyah, that he has about 13 pages of small print, like the kind with no margins and no paragraphs, for about 13 pages explaining the difference of an opinion concerning is sperm najis or not. I'm not mentioning that to uh, say that there's any contradictions in Islam because there's no contradictions in Islam. But to show that sometimes the understanding of the ulama or from person to per person differs so much that it can be a long discussion and a long argument over an issue. On these issues that's a difference of an opinion, we listen to what is said and we follow the best of it. And uh, here we're just trying to be short and to the point. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us, فَسَّلُوا أَهْلَ ذِكْرِ كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Ask the people of knowledge or ask Ahlul Dhikr when you don't know and definitely among them is uh, Muhammad uh, Subhi Hassan Halla and we're asking him and he's giving us the verdict that that which is most weightiest is that sperm is pure and it's not najis the next point was the point of the meta the point of uh, that which is dead from the animals and the Shaykh he says that that which is most weightiest is that it is najis. We have mentioned in the ayah when we mentioned the meta or that which is dead and the blood gushing forth and the pig indeed it is najis or indeed it is rigid that that had referred to the pig only and that it didn't uh, refer to blood gushing forth nor did it refer to the meta. So that isn't going to be used as evidence but what the Shaykh is using for evidence is the statement of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam إِذَا دُبِغَ الْإِحَابُ فَقَدْ طُهَرُ Where the Messenger of Allah alayhi wa sallam, sallam, he said Any skin, if it is tanned, then it becomes pure Any skin, meaning the, from the dead animals Any skin used from the dead animal, if it's tanned, then it is pure As they had asked the Messenger of Allah alayhi wa sallam, sallam, when the animal was dead Could we benefit from its uh, skin or the hide or whatever you call it in the message of Allah والسلام, he said if any skin is tanned then it is pure and from this this shows that before it was tanned that it was najis 
and that only afterwards it is pure. So he's using this hadith to show that that which is dead is najis, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. As far as uh, blood gushing forth being najis, then the shaykh says what is most weightiest is that it is pure. Blood gushing forth isn't najis. And he said, uh, this is because there's no evidence from the Quran and the Sunnah to say that it's najis. And that ayat that we quoted with the maita and the blood gushing, the dead, and the blood gushing forth in the pig, that indeed it is rigid or it is najis, refers to the pig only. And the only reason we made the maita or the dead najis is because of this other hadith of the Messenger of Allah, And because there's nothing for the blood gushing forth, then it remains in its natural state, and that is pure. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. As far as khamr or alcohol, uh, being najis or not Then the shaykh He says that it is Pure And not najis <coughs> Though it is haram Without a shadow of a doubt Though it is haram Without a shadow of a doubt And he says uh, In light of the ayah Where Allah Tabarak wa ta'ala says Innama al-khamru wal-maysir wal-ansabu Wal-azlamu rijisun And this is from uh, Ayat uh, 90 In Ma'idah Where Allah says Khamr and gambling and uh, ansab and islam and these were these uh, things of shirk that they are rigid let me try to get this English word they have uh, from this ayah uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is calling all of these things rigid uh, as Allah says oh you believe Intoxicants, gambling, al ansab and al aslam, or arrows, or as Mursal Khani says, arrows for seeking luck or decision are an abomination of Satan's handiwork. Here, when he says abomination or filthy, then <coughs> the ulama they say that what is meant by this filthy isn't the actual uh, touching of that thing. Meaning it itself But it's referring to uh, What do you call it In an abstract way that the thing is filthy Not that it in itself is nudges And the proof of it is Is gambling Is gambling nudges that you touch it is filthy You have to wash it off And what is gambling except the game And then shooting arrows and whatever And that this is proof that What is meant by it isn't It in itself but it's the act of doing it The act of drinking this khamar is filthy and gambling is a filthy thing to do and like that and not referring to it in itself and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best and uh, we tried to cover that before uh, the shaykh he also uses uh, another ayah from surah al-hajj verse number 30 Fajtani stay away from the filthiness of the idols and here he shows that this is the worship of idols is filthy as this is shirkun billahi ta'ala And it's not referring to the idol itself As the idol might just be made out of clay And from the earth And it's not najis And this is just to show That it's the worship of the idols Which is najis And not the actual thing And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows this As far as the issue of mevyu And this is uh, the pre I think they call it the pre-seminal fluid The fluid that's light in color Clear and it's very thin and a little slimy like that comes out if a man is playing with his wife it's not sperm this fluid uh, he says what is most weightiest is that it's najis that it's najis and this is from the hadith of Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu qala kuntu rajulan madha'an fa'amartu rajulan an yas'ala an nabiya sallallahu alayhi wa sallam li makan ibnatihi فسأل فقال توضأ واغسل ذكرك علي رضي الله تعالى عنه he said that I was a man who used to have a lot of mavi you know when he plays with his wife it's a lot and sometimes it can be coming out almost like you know so much like a man peed on himself and Ali رضي الله تعالى عنه he said so I commanded somebody else to ask the messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم about this mavi because of my place with the daughter of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam As she was the one who <laughs> I was getting all excited over 
so the Prophet wasallam asked to make a uh, wash your private part and make a wudu. So here the Messenger of Allah والسلام, when he says wash it, that was najis and that's why you have to wash it and then you make a wudu and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Yes. No, washing it is with water, not with soap. And this is what we had covered in the last class that, and uh, we're going to cover it in the next class too, inshallah ta'ala, that uh, purifying yourself in Islam is with water. And we mentioned this water is tahir uh, mutahir, a water that is pure in itself and purifying. And this is the type of water that has to be used when uh, it deals with uh, purifying ourselves in Islam. And we said that the water that's mixed with soap, and this water is tahur. Meaning it's pure in itself, but it doesn't purify. So this water that's mixed with soap, it doesn't purify and you can't use it uh, to purify yourself. As far as the issue of the wadyu, and this is uh, the fluid that may come out after you urine. You urinate, wipe yourself, then sometime it might be a little something after that. He says, as for that, then it is najis. And then he uses as his proof... Uh, the statement of Imam Al-Nawi Rahimahullah Ajma'at al-Ummatu ala najasat al-Madhi wal-Wadhi He uses as uh, his evidence He says Imam Nawi Rahimahullah says That the Ummah have agreed That Madhiu and Wadhiu is Najis And this is uh, the pre-seminal fluid And this fluid that comes out after you urinate he said that the Ummah has agreed that it is najis. This is the statement of Imam Al-Nawi, who died 200 and, uh, excuse me, who died 686, I think it is, rahimahullah. As Imam Al-Shawkani came much later as he died 1250, rahimahullah. And Imam Al-Shawkani is saying these are the issues where the ulama differ. And Imam Al-Nawi, rahimahullah, he says that the Ummah has agreed upon it. At any rate, Imam Al-Nawi, rahimahullah, he's from what they call the Muhaqiqin, are from amongst the big scholars who look at everything that has come before his time and then to come out with the strongest verdicts. And he says, if the Ummah agrees on it, uh, and uh, Imam Al-Nawi, rahimahullah, was a Shafi'i and some of the ulama, they say, when he says the Ummah agreed on something, he means the majority of the scholars of the four madhabs agree on that thing. And the Shaykh is just using this to show that uh, uh, the majority of the scholars seem to see that this what you is najis and it seems to be safest to make this the weightiest position as the majority has gone with it and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Uh, I want to make this point that uh, we have to make. That is, the truth isn't determined by how many people are doing a thing. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in some verses in the Quran, وَلَكِنْ أَكْثَرُهُمْ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ Rather, most of them don't know. They show that most of the people want to be astray. If you follow most of the people, they'll lead you astray in ayahs like this in the Quran. However, uh, the shaykh uh, isn't looking at it from that issue as the majority and the minority. This is when it comes to the issue of following a clear text. Then there's no look at the majority or the minority. You have the text and you follow the truth and the case closed. If only one person is going to stand on that ayah, then that person is going to be on the truth, even if the rest of the world went against them. This is, the shaykh is using this on the affairs when there's no clear text to show that the majority of the ulama looking at a general understanding of Islam felt this to be most correct, so it seemed that it would be stronger to go with the majority. This is when there's no clear text in it And it seems like the majority of the scholars That they look That it would be better to go with that And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best So here we see How the shaykh is using the majority To show some strength As opposed to when the truth has been stated clearly In the Quran and the Sunnah Then there's no discussion The next point that the shaykh had wrong Of a difference of an opinion Is the issue of a mushrik and he said that which is the strongest position is that the mushrik is pure. 
And then he goes on to explain that the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, إِنَّمَا الْمُشْرِكُونَ نَجِسْ Indeed the mushrik are najis. Indeed the mushrik are najis. From Surah Tawbah, he says that uh, what is meant from this is that the shirk and the lifestyle of the mushrik is najis. Not that the actual body of the mushrik is najis. And then the shaykh had used, and this is the evidence is that many of the ulama, they use, they say that the Messenger of Allah, alayhi salatu wasalam, he ate the food of the mushriks as the Jews and the Christians had given the Prophet Sallallahu some food and he ate it. And it's been authentically reported on the Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu wasalam, and that he ate from their vessels and that he drank from their vessels and he made wudu from their vessels uh, and that he let the mushrikeen come into the masjid alayhi salatu wasalam, and they didn't show that he poured water on the place where they walked and that uh, evidence is like this that uh, the ulama show that the mushrik are najis, meaning their lifestyle is najis and not uh, and not their bodies. Uh, I had, men- I had uh, before, and I wanted to mention this. I wrote this as a, a side point, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, when we were in school and we were covering this issue and it was a difference of an opinion, and for certainty the overwhelming majority of the ulama the Salaf to the Khalaf, all of them say that the Mushrikun, their persons aren't Najis. That's what is meant is their Shirk and their Kufr. However, when I listened to this argument, I just felt the opposite. The Mushriks are Najis. Their bodies, if you touch them, then it's like touching Dookie. La hawla wa la quwata la billah. At any rate, Amongst ourselves, with the students, we were discussing this, and I said, I felt that this is the strongest. And I want to use this, inshallah ta'ala, to be a lesson for us. Uh, the brothers, they said, I'm amazed that somebody with no knowledge, how he can po- oppose the overwhelming majority of the ulama, of the salaf, and the khalaf. They said, no one would do that, except that he thinks that He's a mujtahid or a big scholar just like them. And that's why he's making the verdict. And nobody would take himself to be like that except he's arrogant, knowing that he only accepted Islam yesterday and he doesn't even know the Qur'an, let alone the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah, alayhi salatu wasalam. Then the people, they went on, uh, some of the people to say, well, nobody would hold a stance like that except that he's off this manhaj or off this methodology of holding fast to the Qur'an and the sunnah with understanding of the salaf of this ummah. Uh, here I, I wanted to show that uh, this statement of brothers that this is a transgression of the bounds, transgressing the bounds on our brothers in Islam. Firstly, when the issue is a difference of an opinion, we haven't been commanded to take it back to the majority of the scholars or anything. We've been commanded to take it back to the Book of Allah and the Sunnah of His Messenger, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And uh, uh, I was taking the arguments of the likes of Ibn Hazm, uh, rahimahullah, who just makes it very clear, and you can see the arguments, and you can see how easy it is for someone to take the position of the minority in an issue like this. Ibn Hazm, rahimahullah, he said, if I were to stand before my Lord, and I'm only paraphrasing, inshallah ta'ala, and Allah knows best, if I had to stand before my Lord, and he asked me, are the mushriks najis or not? I would say, you said, O oh my Lord, Ya Yuladina Amanu, in the Mal Mushrikuna Najis. And I say what you say. You said, Allah in the Quran, O oh, you who believe, the mushriks are najis. And that's just what I say. When I'm asked, are the mushriks najis? Yes, the mushriks are najis. And this was uh, his reasoning, and it seems to be strong as we know we're going to be questioned for the positions we take with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if he asks you, why do you take that? You say, because you said in the Quran. And it seems to be very strong to hold on to that. And you didn't have to worry about, did it really mean uh, their persons or this or that. He even went on to say, in the context of this ayah, it's prohibiting them from coming to al-Masjid al-Haram. Yes, the Prophet ﷺ entered them into the masjids before. This toba, we know that it's amongst the latter surahs that was revealed, as opposed to Ali Imran. 
which was revealed when the uh, Christians came to visit the Messenger of Allah والسلام, in his masjid and Allah revealed Ali Imran this was early in his days of Medina like the fourth year or the third year of Hijra as opposed to Surah Tawbah I think was revealed at the ninth year of Hijra uh, this is the latter part where you don't find where you find the verdicts of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being decisive especially when it comes to the issues of the mushriks as we know before this time that the people had, the Prophet ﷺ had treaties with the disbelievers, and there were certain relations between the Muslims and the Jews and the Christians, and then Allah revealed this to say, hey, this is it right now. And then with that is, don't let them in no more. Don't let the mushriks in to the sacred area anymore because they nudges. And this wasn't just meant, don't let their kufr or their shirk or their ideas come in, but it meant don't let them with their persons. And he says, this is strong enough to say, this is why we take it. And then uh, he mentions the hadith of the Messenger of Allah, alayhi salatu salam, where uh, Abu Thalib al-Khushani, he came to the Prophet sallam and he said, we live with the Ahlul Kitab. Should we eat from their utensils? And the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, uh, for those people who are in the land of Ahlul Kitab, then don't eat out of their utensils. Except if you don't find anything other than that. And then I command you to wash it and then eat from it. And these hadith are from Al Bukhari. This hadith is from Al Bukhari, a Muslim. Here he's saying, see, the Messenger of Allah is saying, don't eat from their things. Just like the Prophet said, when the dog licks it, don't use it until you wash it. The Prophet said the same thing about Ahlul Kitab. Don't eat from their things until you wash it. And this was why. Uh, uh, Ibn Hazm and those uh, who took the position of the minority said that yes their najis and their shirk and their kufr as we saw from the other ayah but still their najis and their persons and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best uh, but what we have to see that on some of these differences of an opinion I just wanted to show both sides of it is that sometimes when it's an issue of looking at the evidences and trying to understand those evidences with a correct understanding in light of the Qur'an and the Sunnah, sometimes you get a, uh, a difference of an opinion amongst the ulama. And that if someone kind of leaned towards the minority position instead of the majority position, trying to be sincere and trying to hold fast to the Qur'an and the Sunnah and the understanding of the Salaf of this Ummah, then it isn't proper that someone say that this person is deviant or that this person is off the correct methodology, or what have you, is that, well, we see it different, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best, who had already covered some of the etiquettes of differencing of an opinion, and that is, when two people read the same ayah, and they come up with different understanding of the same ayah, then they should disperse, as the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam explained, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. But those were some of the issues where the ulama had differed on... Uh, the thing being najis or not. And then Imam Ashokani ended it off by saying, the origin of things is that they are pure, except where you have an authentic narration that would take it from that. That is, everything is pure on the earth, except that we have a text to show that it's not pure. And the ulama, they use the statement of Allah ta'ala in Surah Al-Baqarah, And he is the one who created everything in the earth for you. He is the one who created everything in the earth for you. The ulama, they use this ayah to show that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created everything as pure. All of this is for you. Except what Allah had prohibited, as Allah wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-An'am, verse number 119. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا لَكْ وَمَا لَكْ وَمَا لَكُمْ أَلَّا تَأْكُلُوا مِمَّا ذُكِرَ اسْمُ اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَقَدْ فَصَّلَ لَكُمْ مَا حَرَّمَ عَلَيْكُمْ إِلَّا مَا اضْطُرِرْتُمْ إِلَيْهِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, what's wrong with you that you don't eat that which Allah's name has been mentioned over it? And indeed, everything that is haram has been explained to you, except those things you have been driven to out of necessity. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this ayah he makes it clear. Everything that is haram has been explained to you. Except those things that you have been driven to
to out of necessity and therefore it would be permissible for you to eat it whether it's haram or not. But here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows that everything that's haram, Allah has detailed it to us, has explained it to us. So everything uh, in general is pure unless we have a text to show that that thing is najis. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. And this was the explanation of the statement of Imam al-Shawkani that najasat is the defecation of human beings in general and they urine except for the baby who's breastfeeding and not eating any meat and the uh, saliva of the dog is najis and the droppings of the dung of the animals is najis except for the examples that we had mentioned from drinking the camel's urine and making salat in the sheep's pen and the menstrual blood is najis and the pig's meat is najis and everything other than that is a difference of an opinion and the sheikh had explained that sperm what is most uh, weightiest of the positions is that sperm is pure and what is dead is najis and that blood is pure and that khamr is pure though it is haram without a shadow of a doubt and that uh, this pre seminal fluid is uh, najis, and that the fluid that comes out after you urinate is najis, and the mushrik is najis, uh, and this is in the abstract way, and then with the difference of opinion being the person is actually najis. And there's a narration, and I don't know if it's been translated into English, from the tafsir of Al Tabari, or Hassan al Basri, and we have mentioned that he's from amongst. The big companions of the com- messenger, uh, excuse me, from among the bigger tabi'un, meaning he met big companions of the messenger of Allah, والسلام, and 80 of the companions of the messenger of Allah, والسلام, there's a narration where he says, Whoever shakes the hand of a mushrik, then make a wudu. This narration has not been authentically reported on Hassan al Basri, rahimahullah. And then Imam al Shokani, he says, The origin of things is that they are pure until there is an authentic text that would take them from its state of being pure and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best wa sallallahu wa wa barak ala nabina Muhammad Naam Yes So the question is, the question is, all of the babies urine uh, pure? No. The baby boy who's breastfeeding, who's not eating any meat, then who's not eating any food, his urine is pure, and the baby's girl's urine is najis. Yes. <coughs> Yeah. <coughs> we said it on this ayat where Allah mentions the dead and the blood and the pig indeed it is najis not indeed they are najis so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is only referring to one thing and in Arabic when you say when you use this pronoun then it refers to the closest thing to it and that is the last thing that was mentioned and that is the pig <coughs> Exactly. Just because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes something haram doesn't mean that it is najis. And this is the case of uh, alcohol. And maybe a better case is the case of reefer. <laughs> you just say it just grows straight from the earth, it's clean, it's pure, and this is why people still getting high. Well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had made it haram all types of intoxicants. <coughs> no.
لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله We have a question uh, about the sisters, from the sisters, and it's good that the sisters asked it, inshallah. What about eating in restaurants of the mushrikun, or eating food from their stores? They are cooked in their utensils, or in their pots. Uh, I hope that the sister is meaning by her question a recommendation. All of the brothers don't take your wives out to the restaurants of the mushrikeen. Only go to the halal Muslim shops, restaurants. <clears throat> because the Messenger of Allah والسلام, prohibited us from eating from the utensils of the kuffar, except if we don't find any alternative. Then, if they wash from it, then we can eat from it. In general, everybody would bring the argument, so we'll bring it up. From the beginning, they say that the standards in the restaurants in America, they have to, the water has to be a certain temperature in order to clean the pots and stuff like that. So they clean and we can eat from it. The Messenger of Allah والسلام, only made it permissible to eat from it when you don't find other than that. And Alhamdulillah, in our area, we find other than that. And this shows that it's uh, necessary for the Muslims only to eat from the halal Muslim shops. Uh, this uh, may apply eating in these restaurants for the Muslims uh, who live uh, farther away from the centers where the halal shops are and the people are just forced to eat whatever and uh, in that case uh, after it's washed it may be permissible to eat in it and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us firm on this deed yes. Uh, the brothers saying that they are kafir restaurants that have halal meat. Okay, the meat is halal, the utensils not. And really, uh, they are. And then down on the Willis Street, down the street, from the last time you left us, across the street, there's another one, an African town. They said it's halal, but I don't know. They're Muslim. They just accepted it's not. Downtown. Are women Muslim? They're Muslim. They just accepted it's not? Uh, no, that was their one side. Being from Africa, you could be Muslim. <laughs> what country they say they're from? Uh, Ghana. Uh, Ghana is only 10% Muslim, I think. I don't know if it's a little more now or what. It's more than that? Huh? 40%? You know, the difference, that comes from Yeah. I don't know, Ghana, one of the brothers, he told me 10%. All right, if it's 40%, whatever. Anyway, the calf, Ghana, the calf is in charge. They run it and everything. But uh, they have the 40%? Alhamdulillah, of At any rate, uh, that means you got a 60% chance he mushed it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. <laughs> I don't really want to mention this, but uh, I think the sister going to think I'm unfair if I don't mention it. Wala hawla wala quwata illa billah. She said, oral sex is halal. If the pre-seminal fluid is najis, 
sects and what does this say about all sects? And what should one do? Please expound. I made it clear to everybody, uh, the only expounding I do when I close the door is the expounding that I do when I close the door. <laughs> and Allah knows best. So, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika shadu an la ilaha 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 ila